Number five, the half-life of radioactive cobalt is 5.27 years. Suppose a nuclear accident has left the level of cobalt radiation in a region at 100 times the level acceptable for human habitation. How long will it be until the region is again habitable? Now, what you have here is, is uh, exponential decay. So uh, these radioactive materials are decaying exponentially. And the formula or the differential equation guiding it is this decay equation. If you solve this, it's, a, it's just a regular separable equation. So you multiply dt to this side, divide by y, integrate both sides. And if you do all that, you get this following answer. Now, I put y0 here because uh, that's the value you get when you plug in t equal to 0. If you take this and if you put t equal to 0, you get e to the 0th power, which is 1. And you just get y of 0. What does that mean? That means y of 0 is the initial amount. Now, what is the initial amount? Well, if you say the acceptable level of cobalt is A, then because we have 100 times the level of acceptable amount, so the initial amount is 100A. So you replace y0 by 100A, and this is what you get. Now, let's take into account this uh, half-life, which is 5.27 years. When t equals to 5.27, that means there will be half the initial value, which is half of 100a is 50a. If you divide 100a by 2, it's 50 times a. And therefore, you can set these to equal for time t equals to 5.27. This can be solved for k. Notice that a, a cancels. Right? Divide both sides by a. Uh, and uh, you can even divide by 100a, and you can... Take the ln to cancel the e, and solving for k, you get k as 0.1315. All right, uh, then you can rewrite your y as this. That's the function governing the level of cobalt. And what are we looking for? We are looking for the time t when this value becomes exactly equal to a, which was the acceptable limit. Okay, so we. We now have to solve this equation here, which is again solved similarly. You divide by 100a, take the ln, divide, and then you get 35.02. Therefore, the answer is 35 years. It takes 35 years to go back to the normal level. Okay, here we have a separable equation, I believe. So let's see. This is a this is the differential equation we were given. And in order to solve this, what we have to do is uh, first move uh, this this part to the, the, the right side and then rewrite y prime as dy over dx. So if you multiply the dx to this side, this is what you get. Now, you can see that there are parts where it's completely y and there's parts where it's completely x. And therefore, you can divide or multiply, actually just divide so that you get only function of x on one side and only function of y on one side. If that's possible, you call this equation a separable differential equation. Uh, now, in order to solve this, you just integrate both sides. You have to evaluate this integral and then the integral on the right. Uh, again, we can use this formula that uh, if you have a fraction whose numerator is the derivative of the denominator, then the integral is simply the log of the denominator. Very handy. Appears a lot. So let's use this. See, 1 minus x squared, if you differentiate this, this is negative 2x. So you would want negative 2x on the top. However, before, you didn't have negative 2x. You just had x. But since negative 2, what you need here is only just a constant multiple. You can just put it there, but balance it out by putting the negative 1 half in front. Same thing done over here. Okay. So I pulled the minus up front, and then since I want it 2, because if I want f prime over f, the, this top better be 2y. Derivative of y squared is 2y. And to balance out this 2, I had to put a 1 half in front. Okay, now this formula makes the integral very easy. You just now get this on the left side and this on the right side. Let me just decrease the font a little bit. Okay, so it's, you get the left side and the right side. Uh, this negative 2, negative 1 half is annoying, so let's just get rid of them by multiplying by negative 2. Uh, this should be negative 2c. But it doesn't matter because, you see, uh, if I put this as negative, it's negative. This is just some, some constant again, right? So 
you can just rewrite, rewrite this as C. Sometimes I, I put a C tilde, but it's just some random constant. So I just put it as C. And then I have uh, E and LN canceling. So this is what we get. Finally, solving for Y gives you this. Okay. Uh, yeah, so it's customary to uh, just write C when you really have to write C tilde. See, I want to uh, say C tilde equal to this, and I, I could write C tilde as this, but it's more convenient to just say this C. If you really want to be perfect, you can start by writing here as C tilde instead. So C tilde, C tilde, C tilde, C tilde, and set this equal to C. That will be another way to say it. Okay, so this is our answer. Next, number seven. Here we have a first order linear equation because you have y prime to the first power, y to the first power. So uh, they're both first powers. They're not multiplied together. It's not inside any uh, sine or cosine or anything. So indeed, this is a first order linear. When you have a first order linear, you can always divide by the coefficient of y prime to make it into standard form, which is uh, this form here, y prime plus some function times y equals another function, function of x, I mean. Okay, then we call this thing in front of y as p of x, right? And be careful, if there's a minus in front, you have to include that too, okay? Uh, it's, this is plus, so we just take this one as your p, and uh, you can get the multiplier mx by taking the, the e to the power of the integral of this p function, p dx. And uh, to, to do the integral, you have to split this into two parts, 2x over x, which gives you 2, and negative 3 over x, which is negative 3 over x. And therefore, if you integrate 2, you get 2x. If you integrate negative 3, 1 over x integrates to the log of x. So this is what we have. And then you multiply this as e to 2x and e to the negative 3 ln of x. And uh, you, it's very tempting to cancel this e with this ln here, but you can't do that because uh, there's this negative 3 in, in between. So in order to cancel it, you have to move the negative 3 up over the log and jump it over to the x to the negative 3 like this. Now that you can cancel, which leaves you with x to the negative 3, so uh, the multiplier is x to the negative 3 times e to the 2x. Uh, now, when you get the multiplier, you do not multiply to the original one. You have to multiply to the standard form. This is a common mistake that students make. So you multiply to the standard form. This is what you get. And whenever you get that, this first power here with uh, first part here with y prime involved, that just turns into the derivative of the entire thing. And if you want to see why this the previous one is same as this, you just uh, apply the, pro the the product rule to this, and you'll see that it creates both this and that, just from the product rule. Okay. All right. So integrate both sides Be because we're integrating the derivative. The derivative and the log cancel, leaving you with this. How convenient. So the only thing that we have to worry about is this right side, whose integral is two times e to the two x. Uh, remember uh, e to the a x. So if you have e to the ax, then the integral is 1 over a e to the ax. So um, this uh, 2x, 2 gives you 1 over 2, so 1 over 2 times 4 gives you 2 times e to 2x. And solving this for y gives you this, so that's the final answer. Sorry. Okay, so that's your final answer. Let's move on. Number eight. Check that uh, this differential equation here is exact. How do you do that? Well, remember the one in front of dx should be thought as this uh, some functions derivative with respect to x. And this one here should be thought as some functions derivative with respect to y. Now, we know that the second partial commute, so if I take fx and differentiate by y, and if I take fy and differentiate by x, they should be equal, right? If these two are indeed equal, that means there is this, really this single function responsible for generating both of the terms, okay? In that case, we call the differential equation as, as exact. 
So what I did was I simply calculated each derivative. Here, when you differentiate by y, x is considered as a constant, so you just get 0. Derivative of the arctangent is 1 over 1 plus y squared. That you should know. Now, when we go to this next one, when we, in, when we differentiate this, first, notice that this 1 over 1 plus y squared times x plus y is indeed same as this fraction before. But the reason I'm pulling this out is because, see, this is just the function of y. And function of y with respect to, uh, when you do the partial with, with respect to x, it's considered as a constant. So constants can be pulled out. And that's why we get this. And therefore, uh, we can just differentiate x plus y, which is super easy. x differentiates to 1. y, when you differentiate by x, because it's a partial derivative, it's, it's a 0. And uh, now what do you get? You see that both of them give you 1 over 1 plus y squared. Therefore, they are equal. Since they are equal, we know that it's exact. Now let's go ahead and solve this exact differential equation. When we, again, when we see this differential equation, we're thinking of the first part as some functions partial der derivative with respect to x, and the second one as some functions partial derivative with respect to y. Now, in order to recover the original function from this partial derivative, since this was differentiated by x, you should integrate by x. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to integrate by x. And as you can see, the, der the antiderivative of x is 1 half x squared. And then since arctangent of y is considered as a constant, see, we're trying to undo the partial derivative. So uh, any function of y is considered as a constant. So although this looks scary, all you have to do is treat it as a constant and just attach an x there because that's how you integrate a constant. And then uh, another big difference here is that instead of plus c that you usually write when you do the integral, uh, we're writing here a function of y. That's because it's not just a regular integration, it's a partial integration, partial antiderivative, so that a, a function of y could be treated as a constant. Well, a function of y will always be treated as a constant, so uh, you're not really... Uh, it, this thing could be a function of y, and, and when you differentiate this by x, you can see that the function of y will just get deleted, creating this as your partial derivative with respect to x. So th that's the big difference. Let's do the same thing. You take f of y and uh, do the integral by y to get rid of this uh, derivative with respect to y. That's how you recover your f. Now the reason we have to do this second step is because the first one has this limited knowledge about this function y. Uh, we don't know what this function is exactly, so we have to go to the next clue and try to figure out uh, the, this gy. Uh, when we integrate this, uh, we should actually split it into two fractions, one x over 1 plus y squared and another one y over 1 plus y squared. And then uh, here, because we're integrating by y, x is considered as constant, so you pl pull the x out, uh, and then you have 1 over 1 plus y squared, whose antiderivative is arctangent of y. So that's what you put here. Whereas this one, you can again use that uh, f prime over f thing, uh, and, and uh, because I want 2y here, uh, I, I put a 1 half in front to balance out that this extra 2 that you, you have. So we integrate this to get the one-half log of the denominator. And again, instead of a constant, since we're integrating by y, uh, you can have a function of x here. What we have now is two different descriptions of the function f, this and this. So if you compare th these two, we see that g of y must be talking about to this, this function right here. And h of x must be talking about this function here. So uh, when we harmonize the two different accounts, we can deduce that the function uh, f of x comma y must be this function here. And uh, one thing that you have to be careful is that uh, when we are solving for uh, this differential, exact differential equation, you're really trying to know the relationship between y and x. We're not trying to figure out this function. Solving means you have to find out y. Uh, if you can, 
you should even solve y as a function of x. That's the ultimate goal, right? But but uh, in many cases, when you solve an exact differential equation, you end up with a relation where you can't solve for y. It's, this one is impossible to be solved for y algebraically. Okay. Uh, anyways, uh, uh, a common mistake is to write this and think that's the answer to the differential equation, and it is not. You always have to go down one more step and say this function is equal to c. This here is the solution to the given exact differential equation because uh, to check that it is so, you just have to do uh, implicit differentiation of this and you'll recover this exactly. Part C. Now we have to find a specific solution that satisfies the initial condition y of 0 equal to 1. If you forgot to introduce this C and, and you, if you just stopped here, then this part C will be impossible to solve. Uh, luckily, we do have this C there, so we, we just have to figure out what that C is. Y of Z equal to 1 means that when X is equal to 0, Y should be 1. So replace all the X's that you see by 0 and Y as 1. And this is what you get. So in the previous equation, these X's here are replaced by 0. Y here is replaced by 1 and then when you do that you get the value of c as 1 half log of 2 and you replace it into the c and this is our final answer uh, this is perfectly okay but if you want to simplify it just a little bit more you can multiply by 2 and get this answer which doesn't have any fraction so that's probably better